think a lot of it, you know, these unloved cars, it was, it was what I could afford. And I didn't care that it's a base, that it's this, that it's that. To me, it was, it was a Porsche. So it was, it was everything. Growing up, I was never really into sports, didn't skateboard or snowboard like my friends did. For me, it was just always cars. Even more than cars, it was Porsche. I think my first real core memory with Porsches happened around the time I was four years old. A close family friend of mine sat me on his lap and let me steer his 944 in an empty parking lot. And I think that's why that ended up being my very first car. I was bit by the bug. Any book I could get my hands on was Porsche, would read it cover to cover, collected every magazine that I could. My weekends were spent in dealerships or on the Porsche configurator. It was just game over from that point on. Every car that he had, when I'd come over for Thanksgiving or any family holidays, I'd basically go and sit in the garage and just hang out with the car. I was 17 years old, I saved up all summer and bought a $1,500 944. It was absolutely horrible, but it was the greatest thing in the entire world to me. I had that car for about four months before we realized that it couldn't be a daily vehicle and someone gave me $500 to trade it in towards a new lease. Fast forward a couple years to college, it took about one week for me to take all of the money allocated for living for that school year and I found the least expensive Boxster that was for sale in the entire country. I ran out of gas because I didn't have money to fill the car up. I loved this thing. I think the fact that other people didn't made me kind of like it more. Definitely took a few additional hiccups of cheap Porsches before figuring out, you know, the right things to look for and, and the right ones to buy. After my $1,500 944, it was always my, my halo was to get a 944 turbo. So one day this car came around and it was something that I traditionally would not have ever gone for. Because of its checkered past, nobody wanted to touch this thing. And this car really changed the way that I looked at vehicles. I knew that this car was never going to appreciate. It, it was something that didn't need to be a garage queen. So for the first time, I drove my car unconcerned. It really taught me that all of these cars are, are here to be driven. I transferred to New York City and that was the start of me building a career in automotive. I started with washing cars, moved up to being a valet, valet to the front desk, front desk to the sales floor. I think I was so scarred from my first two horrible examples that I went a while not having a Porsche. I wanted to get back into owning a Porsche and I want a 911. Keeping with theme for my love for the unloved platforms, you know, if it was a 911, it kind of obviously was the 996. I got the car that I always wanted as a kid, a speed yellow 996 4S. And when I got that car, I, I took a piece of black electrical tape and just put it over the odometer so it wouldn't stress me out and I could just get in and drive. I have an affinity for colors and I've affectionately named this the Jelly Belly Collection. Limited run, preferably non-PTS Porsches 
that were kind of overlooked. And I think when you put them together, they all complement each other in their own weird, funky way. Something I noticed going to Cars and Coffee was more and more you'd see these paint to sample GT3s and these cars coming in that you need to know a guy or know a guy in order to get one. And I started looking to what at the time was the more unloved Porsches. The 996 that got so much flack for so long. The Boxster where people would say, oh, it's just a Boxster and started looking at the different platforms and really learning about these specialty vehicles. Like, this limited edition is one of 250 that were built for one year. This Cayman R, Peridot Green, it only, again, one year limited run. It's actually my goal to have that be the highest mileage Cayman R in the US. Part of the Jelly Belly collection was having a bit more fun with it. You could put all these together and have one GT3 or have this track car, this cruiser, it's something that makes you laugh every time you're ripping it. When I think about Porsche, there's so much heritage that goes with them. Um, it's right there with Ferrari, with McLaren, with Aston. It, it's a supercar to me. I think what I like about the underdog platform is that they're not winning any drag races. They're not the fastest cars going around the track, but you don't need to be. The drive that you get in this, I mean, just how visceral this car is. And when you slip into the buckets, the way that you feel, when you put the car into gear, it has a little bit of that like bolt action rifle kind of sound. It's the sum of all those bits that make it even cooler that it's like, yeah, it is the underdog. It isn't the fastest. Being able to find it and ring it out for all its glory, it's kind of more fun to, to drive a slow car fast. This was always my passion and what I was crazy about. There's hobbies that could be a hell of a lot more economical, less time consuming, but being in these cars, spending time around them, it, it brings me back to that four-year-old me being on my godfather's lap and that feeling of just pure joy and excitement. I'm, I'm not able to duplicate that in anything else that I do. The past couple years, I, I don't even turn the radio on in them. It's just my cathartic time. And it's not even that I'm listening to the engine note. It's kind of just that this is my bubble. This is my me time. So those little glimpses, those little times of just escape that I think why all of us deal with the chaos of needing to get out of the city, get to our car, deal with the traffic of driving around New York. Well, you know, for those little bit of openings, those little times of just you and the open road that you get, it's, it's, I think it's worth it.